Hey guys, welcome back to Black Magic Craft. Building and painting my Death Guard army has been my personal hobby project over the past few months that I spend time on periodically whenever I can. I'm not in a huge rush to get it done. I mean, with COVID, I've only actually been able to play two games so far, and I still barely know the rules. But it's been a fun hobby escape for me, and I'm learning a lot in the process. I've got a pretty decent start now with a fair bit of models starting to come together in a really great cohesive style. You might be wondering about my list, and if that's the case, I'm sorry to disappoint you, but I honestly don't care about lists or strategies or winning the game. I'm approaching this simply by building and painting models that I think look cool and, and have no idea about what good or bad or competitive or not. I only plan on ever playing casually and my only real goal goal is to build a cool looking army. Which brings me to my Hellbrute. A kind viewer sent me a bunch of random Death Guard sprues and one of them was the Hellbrute kit. This is not a model that I would have selected or purchased based on my looks cool criteria. I gotta be honest, I think the uh, kit looks uh, mega derpy and I really don't like it very much. But it has some really great elements and bits, and I wouldn't feel right letting it go to waste, so I decided to dive in and do a heavy conversion to make it into something that I think looks rad. And I'd like to share with you a few things that I learned along the way. This kit has a fair bit of pieces and options for what isn't really that large of a model. While I don't think it's a good idea to try and completely plan out a conversion before you start, I did find it useful to take some time looking at all the pieces and getting a good feel for how they go together. This let me see what parts I liked and what parts I didn't. More importantly, it let me figure out what aspects of the overall model I liked and didn't like and how they related to each other. In this case, it was pretty clear that it was the lower half and the stumpy little silly looking legs that I hated the most. I had this fat ogre type mini and it made me think that this Hellbrute would much better fit within my army if I was able to somehow use the lower section of this ogre to replace the ridiculous stumpy robot legs. At this point, I've put together a decent amount of GW models, but I think I've been spoiled so far and only put together models that go together really easily. This kit taught me that this isn't the case for every model. I don't know where this one lands on the scale of build difficulty, but it was certainly far more tedious to assemble than any of the other ones I've done previously. It seemed like every part was made up of several different pieces that didn't naturally fit together in the perfect position. It took a lot more care and attention to get the pieces sitting properly during the gluing, just to avoid them not lining up with other parts in the following steps. While I knew I was going to be bashing the hell out of this thing, I still wanted to ensure the sub-assemblies that I was going to keep were put together properly. Finding a way to merge two totally unrelated bits can be difficult. More so when you have to cut up one of the pieces to get at the portions you want to use. This is where some planning and some visualization is important. If you're going to cut up a model to steal some of its parts, you might only get one shot at doing it. So it's worth taking the time to visualize your cuts to effectively plan them out. The model I wanted to steal from was cast in resin. This meant it was very difficult to cut, and not only difficult, but fairly dangerous. You need to use a rotary tool if you plan on making the cuts in any reasonable amount of time, but this creates a big mess of harmful dust, and you don't want to be breathing that stuff in. It's important to take precautions. Mask, glasses, and dust extraction. I use a shop vac right by where I'm cutting to remove the majority of dust before it gets into the air, but I also have an intake connected to my shop's extraction fan to remove anything else floating around. The point I'm trying to make though is resin sucks to cut up and work with, and it wouldn't be my first choice if I had multiple options. 
If you plan on building up areas with any sort of sculpting medium like epoxy putty, it's important to give yourself a good head start with a solid armature. In my case, I ended up deciding that the only parts of the lower part of the ogre model that I wanted to use were the feet. And I needed a way to go from those little resin feet into the plastic robot legs of the Hellbrute kit. I drilled and pinned the two feet with toothpicks. This would give something for the epoxy putty to attach to. And while I knew that I'd want to sculpt the finishing layers with Milliput, I knew that Milliput takes several hours to cure and harden. I found that building up a rough shape with fast setting epoxy putty that cures in minutes is a great way to move forward quickly with less risk of screwing up your sculpt while handling it. Another part that I wanted to use from the ogre was the face, as the tiny little face on the model just looked silly to me. In order to blend it, I would use Milliput, and I falsely assumed that I could just put down a blob of Milliput and squish the face into it to hold it into place. Turns out this was really ineffective as Milliput is not tacky enough to bond to flat resin very quickly. I would have been much better off just gluing the bit in place with super glue, then applying the Milliput to blend them together. It's worth noting though that you can absolutely get away with super gluing things to uncured Milliput, which is what I ended up doing to make this work. Let's take a quick minute to check out this week's sponsor. Counterspell Miniatures is a brand new line of resin models by 1985 Games. Their Kickstarter is live now and marks the release of the Shade Collection, which is made up of 12 new gothic horror inspired designs. Each model is high in detail and has been created to work within Dungeons and Dragons and similar tabletop RPG rule sets. These will be physical models ready to paint and use and won't require any complicated conversions or kit bashing like I'm doing today. During the Kickstarter, they're offering a really unique exclusive deal where whenever you spend money on this Kickstarter, you'll earn reward credits that you can spend within the backer kit, which will allow you to get more models for free. Currently, about half the models have been designed and sculpted, but as soon as they hit their funding goal, they will get to work modeling the rest. They've got a bunch of stretch goals planned, which will include things like PDFs for Dungeons and Dragons, extra models, and free add-ons for backers. I'll put a link in the video description to their Kickstarter that you can go check out for more details and back to get some of those cool rewards and extra free models. Thanks 1985 Games for sponsoring this video and for supporting hobby YouTubers like myself. One mistake I made was using way too much of the first epoxy putty on the legs. I wanted this guy to be big and flabby, but the foundation I created with the first putty was just too large and left me with very little leeway in terms of applying the milliput after to do the actual sculpts of the flab. In hindsight, I should have made the first layer like half the size or less. At a certain point, uh, it became impossible to sculpt large areas of the model while manhandling it. Basically, every time I changed positions or wanted to put it down, I ended up smudging or flattening or otherwise damaging something I had just sculpted. So at this point, I realized I needed to put it onto some sort of handle so I could hold it and put it down without worrying. Sometimes it's okay to go ham and just keep adding things. A big nasty Nurgle demon covered in armor and weaponry is one of those times. The most enjoyable part of this build was the addition of random Death Guard bits to make this thing even more unique. The addition of parts from other kits not only helped to give it more life, it also helped to make it cohesive with the other models in the faction. Using this leftover piece from some fetid bloat drone models will help make it feel like it's from the same place as those models, while also creating this really weird papal looking hat thing that I kind of really love. Repurposing some armor plates from the kit to make a helmet and a bever, bever, is that how you say it? I don't know, the chin neck armor plate 
piece. Uh, these uh, help to create a lot of character uh, on the model, in my opinion. It's really neat how once your conversion reaches a certain point, additional bits sort of just find their places naturally, and it becomes very easy to add more in ways that really fit. The start of a conversion can be challenging and frustrating, but the final stages of conversion are so damn fun, it makes the whole process totally worth it. In a previous video, I outlined my Nurgle painting scheme in great detail. So if you're interested in the specifics of how this guy was painted, check out that video for the recipe. Early on with this army, I tested out different painting methods. And as I painted my first batches of models, I created a step-by-step -step paint method that could be applied to the basic plague bearer demons, to plague marines, all the way up to vehicles and character models. The recipe scaled, the steps were the same every time, and they only really varied by the ratio of fleshy bits to armor and metal bits. Having this painting scheme well-defined ahead of time means that when I go to paint a model, there's no decision paralysis or procrastination because of it. I can just jump right in and do the steps. This not only means that I can force myself to get going on the task more easily, it also means that the whole process is faster. I was able to do this entire paint job for this fairly large model in just a couple hours and I didn't have any stress doing it. With each model or unit that I paint for my army, I follow the same basic painting scheme and then allow myself some freedom to mix up things in the final stages with washes and weathering and effects. This allows each model in the army to be slightly different while still feeling like it belongs to the same overall theme. If you're ever making a model and you need a very specific base size but don't have one, and let's say the GW store is closed, I don't know, maybe because of massive COVID lockdowns or something like that, and you have a 3D printer, well, you're in luck. Thankfully, there are many great sculptors providing cool looking bases sized for various games that you can print at home. I was in a pinch and I needed a 60 millimeter base and I found this great looking one that I bought on my mini factory. It perfectly suits this model. I'll put a link in the video description if you wanna get some of these for yourself. I wanted to have some of the liquid effect that I was using on the base pouring out of the gross pipe coming out of this guy's belly. For the liquid, I was using five minute epoxy tinted with some contrast paint. In order to do the drip, I needed some sort of thin clear armature to apply the resin to. Now fishing line is a great item to do this with, but I didn't have any. In the past, I've used little strips of UV resin or hot glue, but have always struggled to get them thin enough or looking right. This time around, I tried something new and cut a thin strip of clear plastic packaging and it worked far better than anything I've used before. Of all the things I've learned in this conversion, this is the thing that I'm the most excited about and will probably use the most in the future. Personally, I'm really proud of this conversion and I'm absolutely in love with how it turned out. I hope that you enjoyed this video and learned something useful along the way. If you wanna pick up some supplies to do your own kit bash or model conversion, consider shopping through the links on blackmagiccraft.ca. Using that resource to do your hobby shopping is a great way to ensure you are getting what you need while helping fund the production of videos like this. And if you really wanna go further in helping me create these videos for the community, the best way you can do that is by supporting the channel on Patreon. Becoming a supporter on Patreon gives you access to videos early, a Discord server, and the Black Magic Craft Fellowship Facebook group. We'd love to have you as the newest member. That's it for this week, guys. Cheers and happy crafting.